one recurring theme in mathematics, when we define a class of objects, we're interested in finding rules that let us construct new objects from the objects that we already have. We have the definition of a group and a handful of examples. So one way to get new groups is to look inside of the groups we already have. So we're looking for groups inside of groups. This brings up the notion of a subgroup. We'll let G be a group, multiplication. We'll omit the multiplication when we write things out. We'll have the definition, a non-empty subset H and G. It's called a subgroup of G. If H is a group contained inside the group G. Now, for the definition, we'll just need, okay, we have our four properties for H to be a group. I'll need H to be closed under multiplication. So if X and Y are in H, then the product is in H. Second on our list would be associativity. But since H is a subset of G, we get that for free. So we don't need to show that. Third would be the identity element. But we'll show that we can get that for free from the last property, closure under inverses. So if X is in H, then X inverse is also in H. Now note, our H is non-empty, so there's some X in H, which means X inverse is in H. X times X inverse is the identity element. Since we're closed under multiplication, that means the identity element's in the group. So it's automatically in there once we have these two properties. Now, in practice, we would need to show that H is non-empty. So often that's going to be obvious because we're working with an actual subset that we can put our hands on. When that's not the case, what we should try to do is look for the identity element, and that's usually going to be the easiest element to look for. Now, H is a finite subset of G. Then we can shorten our list to just showing closure under multiplication and non-empty. Note, H is always finite when G is a finite group. Now, this means these conditions imply that H is closed under inverses. Let's show that. So, we'll pick an X and H. We want to show that X inverse is also an H. We'll consider the subset. So I'm going to take X. X times X is X squared. X times X times X is X cubed, and so on. Now, because H is closed under multiplication, all of these powers are contained in H. And because H is a finite subset, that means this list is also finite. So at some point, it's going to turn back on itself. That means there's going to be some m and n, such that x to the m is equal to x to the n. We're going to multiply on both sides by x inverse m times, this we call that x to the minus m. That gives us, okay, x to the minus m times m is going to give me the identity. On the other side, we have x to the n minus m. Now, n minus m is going to be an integer that's greater than or equal to 1, so let's call that k. We have two cases. If k is equal to 1, x is the identity element, and then it's its own inverse. Otherwise, I could split x to the k as x times x to the k minus 1. That means we have an element in our group, such that if we multiply it by x, we get the identity. That means x inverse is equal to x to the k minus 1. So, closed under inverses. Now, given any group, we have at least two subgroups. We have the subgroup formed by the identity element. We call that the trivial subgroup. And we have the group G itself. All other subgroups we call proper subgroups. Now, for concrete examples, First, let's consider the integers under addition. So if I consider a subset of even integers, we can go through our list of conditions to be a subgroup. So if we take an even plus an even, we get another even integer. So we're closed under multiplication or addition here. If I take any even integer, I could write that as 2 times k. 
its inverse is going to be minus 2 times k, and that's another even integer. So closed under inverses. We also have the identity is equal to 0, and that's an even integer also. So even integers form a subgroup. Now note, odd integers are not a subgroup. If we take an odd plus an odd, we get an even. So it's not closed under addition. And we also have that the identity, which would be 0, is not in our subset. So definitely not a subgroup. Now, if we want to consider other subgroups of the integers, they're going to be all the form n times z, which is just a set of taking all integers, multiply each one by n for some fixed integer n. So I'll leave it to you, show that that's a subgroup. We could also show that all subgroups of the integers are of this form. Okay, we could also consider modular integers. So I'll take z mod 10 under addition. So recall, the set for z mod 10 is gonna be the set of labels, 0, 1, 2, up through 9. Our group multiplication or addition is usual addition or subtraction. Then we just add or subtract multiples of 10 until we wind up back in the set of labels. So some subgroups we have here that are proper. I have 0 and 5. So our set's finite, so it's enough just to show that we have closure and non-empty. So 5 plus 5 gives me 10, which is 0. So this is closed, it's non-empty, so subgroup. I have another subgroup given by this set, so we're just going to take the even labels. Note, non-empty, and if we add any two of these, we get another element in the set. So we have closed under multiplication or addition. So this is a subgroup also. Finally, if I take our symmetric group on three letters, so the symmetries of an equilateral triangle, we'll have subgroups given by taking the identity element with any of the reflections. So this is just gonna be, you take one, two, if I multiply it by one, two, we get the identity. So close under multiplication, non-empty, so a subgroup. We also have a subgroup formed by the rotations. So again, if I multiply this by itself, we get one, three, two. If I multiply this element by this element, we get the identity. So close under multiplication, subgroup. Now, all the examples on this board are special. These are what we call cyclic subgroups. So that's our next definition. Now, if we pick an element G from our group, we could form the cyclic subgroup generated by G. This is gonna be the small subgroup that contains G. So what other elements have to be in this subgroup? Because subgroups are closed under multiplication, we have to have all powers of G, so G, G squared, G cubed, and so on. We know G inverse is in here, and we have to have all powers of G inverse, so G to the minus two, G to the minus three, and so on. Then, if I take G times G inverse, we get the identity element. So that's all we're gonna to need to get a subgroup. We'll denote this subgroup by angle brackets around G. Now with that, we have the definition. We'll call G a cyclic group if we can write G as angle bracket of little g for some little g in the group. So this means every element in our group can be written as a power of little g, including negative powers. Now, for examples, if we take the integers under addition, this group's generated by the element one. So if I add one to itself so many times, we'll get all the positive integers. The inverse is minus one, and if we add that to itself so many times, we get all the negative integers, we put in zero, and then we get everything. So this is a cyclic group. Because it has infinitely many elements, we call it infinite cyclic. On the other hand, we take our modular integers, so we'll fix some positive integer n greater than one. This will be generated by the element one also. So in this case, the way to think of it, we're on a clock, I'm at one o'clock. If I keep adding one, 
we're going to go all the way around the circle until we come back to one. So we're going to sweep out all the labels in Z mod n. This we'll call cyclic of order n. For an example that's not cyclic, we can consider the symmetric group on three elements. So in this case, if we take any element of order two, we'll never generate an element of order three, and vice versa. So none of the elements are able to generate all of S3. We could generalize this procedure. So instead of using a single element, we can consider any subset in our group. We'll call the corresponding subgroup, the subgroup generated by the subset of GIs. So denote that by putting our subset in angle brackets. Now formally, this is going to be the intersection of all subgroups that contain the subset of GIs. In practice, we take all the GIs, we take all the GI inverses, and then we consider all possible products of those elements. Now, for this to make sense, we should check that if I take an intersection of any number of subgroups, then we get another subgroup. So let's prove this statement. So we need to show closing our multiplication, closing our inverses, and non-empty. For closure under multiplication, let's pick two elements, x and y, in the intersection. Because x and y are in the intersection, x and y are in each a sub i. Since h sub i is a subgroup, the product is also in h sub i. That means the product is going to be in the intersection, since it'll be in each a sub i. So close under multiplication. Same idea, to show closed under inversion, if x is in the intersection, x is in each h sub i. So because h is a subgroup, it's closed under inverses, and x inverse is in each h sub i. So x inverse is also in the intersection. Now, we're working with arbitrary subgroups here, so to show non-empty, we'll show the identity element is in the intersection, and that follows because the identity element is going to be in each of our subgroups. So non-empty. So that means the intersection is a subgroup. Now, for the subgroup we have here, okay, we have to make sure we have at least one subgroup that contains all of our elements, and we get that by using the subgroup, which is the entire group. So this is going to be a non-empty set. For concrete examples, first, we can write S3 as a group generated by any two two cycles, or as a group generated by any two cycle with any three cycle. If we move to S4, so here, recall, we have the symmetries of a regular tetrahedron, okay, including reflections, I can consider the subgroup generated by all three cycles. So to get a subgroup, we put in the identity element, and then I add in all products of disjoint two cycles. Now, this subgroup has 12 elements. We call it A4, the alternating group on four letters. Inside of A4, we'll have many subgroups, but one of particular interest will be take the identity element and the products of disjoint two cycles. So this is a subgroup of order four. It's not obvious by looking at it, but this subgroup is abelian. We'll take another look at this example later on. Now, how should we think of A4? So A4 is gonna be a subset of the symmetries of the regular tetrahedron. This subset is gonna consist of the rigid motions. So these are going to be the symmetries of a regular tetrahedron that don't turn it inside out. There's a result from linear algebra that says that each rigid motion is given as a rotation. So this is going to be clear when we're talking about our three cycles. So for instance, if I took two, three, four, what we do is I fix the one, and then we're going to send two to three, three to four, four to two, so we're just rotating in that plane by 2 pi thirds. Now, we want to identify the products of disjoint two cycles also as rotations. 
But how do we do that? So let's take one, two, three, four. So this says we're gonna switch one and two and three and four. And the way I do that, okay, so we take our points like this. We're just gonna rotate by 180 degrees like that. Now, that means the plane we're rotating in is coming out of the board like this. For a final example, we consider the regular tetrahedron. I'll remove the front edge and the back edge, and they'll flatten out so that we have a square in the plane. We'll consider the subgroup generated by the four cycle, one, two, three, four, and the product of disjoint two cycles, one, four, two, three. So the four cycle is just gonna be a rotation by 90 degrees counterclockwise, the product of disjoint two cycles is just going to be a flip through this horizontal line. Now, the subgroup is going to generate all symmetries of the square. So we'll call this D sub 8, the dihedral group with eight elements, sometimes written as D4. Now, I'll leave it to you to figure out all elements in D8 written in cycle notation and to match them with the symmetries of the square. If we instead think of our group elements as giving us symmetries of the complex plane, so we can think of our square as being centered at the origin in the complex plane, then we can think of the four cycle, one, two, three, four, as multiplication by i. Okay, so multiplication by i gives us a rotation of the plane about the origin by 90 degrees counterclockwise. And I can think of our product of disjoint two cycles, one, four, two, three, as complex conjugation. 